Good morning, my friends, and praise the Lord. I'm Mike Morris, Senior Pastor of For God's Glory Ministries, right here in Rancho Cucamonga. I almost forgot the name of my own city. Um, it's a beautiful day. The sun is coming out. And the beautiful thing is from where I'm sitting, I can actually see that the sun is coming out. So I get to talk to you and enjoy just a little bit of the beautiful day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Well, I want to welcome you to another live streaming event uh, sponsored by our ministry. And I'm so grateful for all of you who continue to participate, who continue to support us, continue to allow us to sow into your lives. Now, I also today, I want to give a shout out to some folks that we haven't always recognized. Sometimes I forget to mention that we have people in Ventura County watching us. So hello to all of you in Ventura County. And you know what? How about Bakersfield? We have people from Bakersfield or Kern County who watch us and who chime in. So thank you so much for your participation. And even in the state of Texas, hello, Texas. Praise the Lord to you. God-loving people in that great big state of Texas. Now, I also want to give a brief shout out and hello and good morning and praise the Lord to four little people, four young people, tiny little people that are very special to me. They are little L. Hello, little L. I hear that L watches her grandpappy every Sunday. I've seen pictures of her watching the computer. I think sometimes it's on the television. Hello, L. I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you for watching. And also, little Noel. She's probably too young to fully understand. But hi there, Noli. I love you. And Eden, little Eden. Also, probably too young to fully understand, but hello there, Edie B, and my little Lukey, my only grandson. He's still too young to understand, but I want him to know that I love him, and I'm so grateful that he's in front of the television as Grandpappy tries to do what God has called him to do. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining it is a privilege and a joy to meet with you each Sunday morning, and I'm just so glad to be with you. So let's have a brief moment of prayer before we go into God's Word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to live to see this day. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for our health. We thank you for our strength. Lord God, we Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for following through on the redemption plan. We thank you for these opportunities to get together. And we're thankful in advance for the word that's going to go forth and the difference that it's going to make in our lives. Lord God, we pray for everyone in the United States of America. But especially we pray, Lord God, as you told us to, for our leaders. We pray for our current president, Lord God. Give him the heart to do the right things the right way. Soften his heart, dear Lord. Help him understand that there is a greater plan and that he has played his part in it and he can continue to play a part in it, Lord God, according to your will. Help him to have peace, Lord God, that passes all understanding in this difficult time for him. And Lord God, we pray for our incoming president and vice president, Lord God. We ask that you would give them wisdom. We ask that you would guide them, Lord God, as they prepare to take over the reins of this great country at these very challenging times. We thank you, Lord God, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, this morning we will be sharing and what will be the first part of a two-part conversation or a share, sharing of a story. The subject matter comes at a very opportune and even poignant time 
that is for us that are living in the United States of America. We will learn about the power of God as it manifests itself in how he uses mere humans as instruments for his amazing and awesome purposes. We will witness the power of possibility and we will learn to expect the unexpected whenever man's narrowness of mind and narrowness of vision clashes with the big old heart of God and the big plans that he has to do through his people, his servants. We will see the impact of partnership as well as redemption, realizing that great things can happen, great things are possible if we would only give each other a chance. We can disagree without being disagreeable. We can be different without hating. We can do these things together, but only if we give one another a chance. And we will all be reminded that as people under God, we have far more in common than whatever it is that may divide us. The wonderful book of Acts, not very often preached from, it provided, provides us with these amazing and valuable lessons. And so I pray this morning that God will bless and enrich all of us as we share this brief biblical journey together. Now, we will start in the book of Acts. And if you can turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 11, and we will begin at verse 22. So that's Acts chapter 11 and verse 22. And our context is that Jewish Christians, you may not realize this because we've been so used to having Christianity, but Christianity was birthed out of Judaism. It was birthed through the Jews, let's say it that way. And it really was a Jewish thing. They thought of it as purely a Jewish thing. And largely it was focused around Jerusalem. Now the truth is, after folks left the first Pentecost that, that we attend to on that wonderful first Pentecost day, it actually began to spread, the news of Jesus began to spread throughout all of the Roman Empire. But as the focal point being Jerusalem, where the apostles were and where the church was, you could say, headquartered and focused, it was a Jewish thing. But by this time, the leader, Peter, had come to realize and the rest of them were now coming to grips or trying to come to grips with the idea that non-Jewish folk could be saved. Somebody not like them, somebody that didn't quite look like them, somebody that didn't quite talk like them could also be saved. This was an important thing in the entire history of Christianity, and that is the context that we will learn within today. So let's go to verse 22 of Acts chapter 11 together. It reads this way, then tidings of these things, what things? The fact that God loves Gentiles just like he loves Jews. The fact that salvation was offered not only to those Jews and those Jews in Jerusalem. So then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So he's going as far north as Antioch from Jerusalem. So what we see and learn here is that this brother Barnabas was trusted and respected. This was a big deal. This was big news, and they heard about what was going on up north in Antioch of Syria and also in Damascus. And they needed to send somebody that they trusted 
somebody that they respected to go and check on these things. We'll go on to verse 32. It reads, who, when he came, that is Barnabas, and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart, they should cleave unto the Lord. Lord, hold on to the Lord, embrace and stick with the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, full of faith that is, and much people was added unto the Lord. So here, as we're learning about this first important and key character in this story that we want to uh, share, in this journey that we want to go on, we see that Brother Barnabas was, while he was trusted and respected, we're learning even more about him in, verse, in this verse uh, 24 as well as 23. He was trusted and respected by the church leaders, but we also see he was a good man. He had a good heart. Now, this is the same Barnabas who, if you were to look earlier in the book of Acts, that sold everything that he had and turned it over to the church. So we see that he was trusted and respected. He was a good man with a good heart, but he was also fully committed. Unlike Ananias and Sapphira, that tried to get the credit that Barnabas got for being committed, but while trying to hold back on God and they paid the price with, of their lives. Now, as Barnabas has gone to Antioch, there's no doubt now that he's learned of the shocking and unbelievable conversion of Saul to Christianity. Now, this is the same Saul who attended and also encouraged the stoning death of Stephen. This was a Saul that breathed fire against Christians and led many of them to jail and to their deaths. This same Saul, the arch enemy of the first century or the original Christians. So almost nothing could have been harder to believe than the conversion of Saul. Now, he wasn't in Antioch anymore. He had left and gone off to receive of the Lord and set up his camp in Tarsus. He was not very welcome. Many people struggled with the whole idea that Saul of Tarsus, the arch enemy of Christianity, could possibly be one of them, could possibly be laboring shoulder to shoulder with them. So many struggled with this concept. But now given this fact, what Barnabas does next tells us even more about this character that we're coming to be aware of in this great original Christian man. Let's look at verses 25 and 26 together. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus, for to seek Saul. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. So he went to Tarsus and he got brother Saul and brought him back to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So we think of Jerusalem as obviously the capital, if you will, of Judaism. That's where the temple was. That's where the presence of God was in the temple for the Jews. But as Christianity began to develop, while the leaders of Christianity were in Jerusalem, Antioch to the north, in Syria began to evolve into, you could say, the northern capital of Christianity. And so this is where we see here that that very Saul of Tarsus that had been breathing fire against Christians has 
been recalled by Barnabas to come back among the brethren. And they spent a full year working together. So what we see here as former arch enemies who were both at the death, likely at the death of Stephen on two opposite ends of the spectrum. We see that Barnabas here has not only given Saul a second chance, but that they became comrades in the Lord and extremely close partners in ministry. Now, their bond actually goes even deeper as both of them, and you'll see this down in verse 30, both of them were chosen together to take the financial relief down to Jerusalem because there was a famine that had developed in the land and the toughest area was Jerusalem. And they wanted the Christians there to have sustenance. So they gathered an offering and who else? other than new best buddies, new as thick as thieves buddies. Saul and Barnabas were chosen with the honor and the privilege and the responsibility to take the funds down to the Christians in Jerusalem. But one thing that you'll notice if you go back and you read this, you'll notice something that's very important that whenever Saul and Barnabas are mentioned, and this, of course, Saul became Paul, but whenever they're mentioned in this section of scripture, in this portion of the book of Acts, actually Barnabas is mentioned first. Barnabas was the end man. He was the made man. Barnabas was the respected leader. Barnabas was the one that was most trusted or trusted first. So notice that Saul and later Paul takes actually second billing to Barnabas. So take note of that. Now, after they had spent time together traveling down to Jerusalem, and after they had completed their ministry, their job, I'm sure they did some teaching while they were down in Jerusalem as well, but they delivered the funds to the very needy Christians there in Jerusalem. At that point, we get the opportunity to see the next figure in the story that we have to come to know. So if we'll go down to uh, verse 25, we're in chapter 12 now, and verse 25, where we see it says, and Barnabas and Saul, notice Barnabas's name first, Barnabas and Saul return from Jerusalem, so now they're back in Antioch. When they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, when we say surname, we mean our last name, right? Our family name. But in the Bible, when it says surname, it really means nickname. And really in the New Testament, what we're really saying, like John in the, in the Hebrew would have been more like Jonah. Like Jonah, that was inside the whale, if we were to translate his name over to a name we'd recognize, it would be John. And his surname, or his name that would be fashioned from the Greek, so it likely would have been Marcus, but of course translated here as Mark. So we're getting an idea about this third party, if you will, that now has come on the scene. So this John Mark, is the nephew of Barnabas. He was the son of Barnabas's sister, Mary. And so while Barnabas and Saul came to Jerusalem as a duo, they left Jerusalem as a trio. That is Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark. Now let's move on to chapter 13 as our story continues. I told you this would be like a story. I hope you see the character development so that we can understand and learn from these characters. Verse one reads, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger 
and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So what do we see here? We see that Barnabas is mentioned first, and Saul is mentioned last. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, now this next part will jump off the page at you. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, I'm just going to stop right there. The Bible, you don't see this very often, especially in the New Testament. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, so they were getting very serious there. It says that the Holy Ghost said, now I'm going to stop there. The reason is because this is important. This is a big deal because in the Christian era, sometimes we find folks that every few seconds, especially from the pulpit, but not always from the pulpit, people are saying, God said this, and the Holy Ghost said that, and God told me to do this, and the Holy Ghost told me to do that. I'm just going to tell you, God doesn't talk that often. <laughs> so anybody that's every other breath telling you God said this and God said that, I'm just telling you, there are other voices. There's their own voice in their head. There's the enemy's voice. There's what they want to hear, what they want to believe. God doesn't talk that much. So when we hear or when we see or when we read that God said something, that Jesus said something, that the Holy Spirit spoke, oh, you know, it's a big deal. And so it says here, as they ministered and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, meaning sanctify me, ordain for me. Barnabas, notice Barnabas first again, and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So these two men, former arch enemies, now have become close partners in the ministry and now it has been sanctioned. It has been ordained. God has chosen them to be laborers together, a dynamic and sanctified duo by the Holy Spirit. Now, it's one thing to say you have covenant partnership, but it's a whole nother thing for the Holy Spirit to say that it should be so. We go on to read, and when they had fasted and prayed, notice all this fasting and praying. These were some serious Christians. And laid hands on them. That is, they fasted and prayed and laid hands on Saul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Saul. They sent them away. They're sending them off onto their first missionary journey. As we're Bible studiers, we look at the missionary journeys as Paul's missionary journeys. Why? Because he is ultimately the common denominator and eventually emerges as the leader of the church as it pertained to Gentiles outside of Jerusalem. And so they sent them away, verse 4. So they sent forth by the Holy Spirit ghost, but sorry, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, notice, sponsored by the Holy Ghost, dispatched via the Holy Ghost, they departed unto Seleucia, and then they went, they sailed on to Cyprus. So this is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. They're now being dispatched out to the very first missionary journey to take the word to the world to actually do what Jesus said in the Great Commission, to go out and preach the gospel to all nations, to all peoples. It's not just a Jewish thing. And it's a good thing because most of us listening today, if not all, are Gentiles. We are not Jews in the flesh, but we're Jews in the spirit. We are engrafted into the family of God through the Holy Ghost. And so as they began this journey, they went through the port city of Seleucia. 
And then they sailed westward to the island of Cyprus, their first real stop on their missionary journey. Now, this happened to be the home of Barnabas. So Barnabas not only was the key leader in the forefront at the moment, but he also had a home court advantage or a home field advantage as they went to Cyprus. And they had a lot of dealings there at their first stop, their first big stop there in Cyprus. And they had some difficult challenges there, but they overcame them. And the main challenge was this evil sorcerer that they had to deal with. But God moved mightily and they made a difference there in Cyprus despite the challenges. But now they left Cyprus and they set sail for a place called Perga. And what you'll notice as you read it in the Bible is that now as they leave Cyprus and they move on towards Perga, now Saul is called Paul. And now as you read, Paul becomes the leader in the forefront. And you'll also notice that Paul is named first and Barnabas is named second. And so they ministered there and began to establish Christianity there in Perga on this first missionary journey. And from Perga, they went on to Antioch. Now, this is a different Antioch. This is Antioch of Pisidia. And all of this area is what we now consider Turkey. So they've gone from Seleucia to Cyprus. They sailed there and now they've sailed from Cyprus to Perga. Now, Paul is the key leader. He's now out front. And now they've moved on to Antioch of Pisidia, not Antioch of Syria, which was the northern capital of Christianity, but now Antioch of Pisidia. But as they went to Antioch of Pisidia, they were persecuted tremendously because the Christians or, or the non-Christians, the, the Greeks, the Gentiles embraced this. And so did many Jews, but the non-believing Jews were not happy. They didn't like it. And so they were persecuted tremendously. And so they moved on to Iconium. And the same thing happened in Iconium. And they threatened to stone them to death. So what did they do? After having ministered and established the word there, they left this time they had to leave running and they went to a place called Lystra. Now in Lystra, they were initially, because of the miracles that they did, they were hailed as gods. And Paul being the leader was the biggest God and then Barnabas was also hailed as a God. But guess what? Trouble continued to follow them. And specifically those unbelieving Jews just couldn't have it. I mean, they were haters to the nth degree. And so they followed them to Lystra. And so the same people who were hailing them as gods turned on them. And this time they didn't just threaten, but Paul himself was stoned nearly to death. Not Barnabas, but Paul. He paid the price of leadership. And so having survived it, although barely, they were able to get themselves together enough to move on to a place called Derby, and they ministered there. Now, you can see that they've gone through a lot by this time. And their relationship has changed somewhat with Paul emerging as the more forefront, in the forefront as a leader, but they're going through a lot together. And you can just imagine their relationship is deepening. Have you been through a lot with someone? Have you been through tests and trials and difficulties with someone? Had you ha have to claw your way out of a difficult situation with someone by your side? That relationship gets deeper through difficulties. And so these guys were two very serious Christians who were asked to do very serious work and were called to be together 
miraculously, they never would have ever thought that they would be working together. But here's what I also want you to know. After having gone through all of this in Cyprus and then Perga and then Antioch of Pisidia and on and on all the way to Derby, they hadn't given up. Despite the persecution, despite the threats, despite the near death experience, let me tell you what these two guys did. They retraced their tracks. Yeah, you heard me right. They went back to the very places that they were threatened. They went back to the very places that Paul nearly lost his life, back to the very places where their haters were. They risked their lives going back to each and every stop to confirm those churches, to solidify those churches, to solidify the doctrine and the gospel and to establish leadership. This was amazing work. This was the great commission coming to life because two men called by the Holy Ghost chose to answer and to fulfill the calling that they were called to. Great things happen, my friends, when you say yes to God, even if it's under completely surprising and unbelievable circumstances, even as if it's with someone that you never thought you'd be laboring with. And so having traced their tracks, risking their very lives to do so, they finally returned to Antioch, Antioch of Syria this time. And they had now spent two years laboring together in the Lord, two years going from city to city, two years sharing the good news, the gospel to Jews and Gentiles alike without any bias or discriminatory activities, only caring about God's message and the people that they needed to reach. So they spent the entire first missionary journey together, sharing experiences that cemented this relationship as we learn about these two key characters in our story today. These experiences furthered and deepened their bond. What a team, what a duo, what a dynamic duo. Two very unlikely allies I mean, let alone partners, okay? There's no way that you would think that they would become partners, thick as thieves, the way that they did. And they accomplished so much together. And it should give us hope of what we can accomplish together, even if it's with people who are different from us in some way, whether it's a different race, speaking a different first language, or in the past, Maybe you had grave disagreements. Maybe you had to find a way to disagree and still be agreeable. This is amazing. Expect the unexpected, my friends, whenever you're walking in the realm of the Lord. But there's one very important part to this story that's still actually missing. And so if you'll go with me here, still in chapter 13, but let's now go to verse 13. We've learned all about Saul, now Paul, and Barnabas, and the amazing work that they did on this first missionary journey, establishing the churches, having gone through once, risking their lives, and then going back through on their way back, doubling back and reinforcing the word and the doctrine of the Lord, the good news. So let's go to chapter 13, verse 13, and see what it has to offer us. It reads, now when Paul, notice Paul, Paul and his company, this is completely changed. So Paul and his company, Barnabas isn't even mentioned. Now that doesn't mean he's not important, but just notice the change. Now when Paul and his company loosed or left from Paphos, 
And now what they're talking about here is back when they went through Seleucia and they went on their ship to westward to Cyprus, there was a city on Cyprus called Paphos that was their last stop before they actually uh, went on to Perga. And so it says, so, so it's actually, we're, we're going backward now a little bit. Now when Paul and his company loose from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. Okay, so this is talking about going from Paphos to Pamphylia. But here's the key. It says, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Who's John? John Mark. Remember, they left Jerusalem as a trio. And they went up to Antioch, right? And we saw that the Holy Ghost called Saul and Barnabas, or at the time, Barnabas and Saul, to be segregated, to be sanctified, to be a dynamic duo, to do this work for the Lord. But now we find out that it wasn't just a duo. It actually ended up being a trio, at least on the first two stops in the early portion of Seleucia and then to Cyprus. But after they left the, the home court, the home field of Barnabas, that is John Mark's uncle, Mark didn't make it past Cyprus. Mark couldn't hang. Mark wasn't ready. Whatever his deficiencies, he was not ready to do that kind of work. And so he bailed. And he bailed early on. They hadn't been threatened like they eventually did yet. They certainly hadn't been stoned like what happened to Paul. So he missed the hardest part of the journey, the hardest part of the assignment, and yet he could not hang. And interestingly, he hadn't even been really mentioned. It hadn't been called out that he left with them. We presumed that when they prayed and launched them off on this missionary journey, that there were two people that were prayed for. And we still don't know any different from that. But what we now know is that there was a trio initially, but then it became two because John Mark, someone who was allowed to go on to do this great work, did not finish the work. He couldn't hang. Isn't that something? And this verse reveals for us, lets us know that this event happened, that he didn't make it all the way to finish the journey, to finish the work. So what's that all about, you may ask? It, why is he on that journey at all? The Holy Ghost didn't mention his name. Well, my friends, stay tuned. Because next time, we're going to learn even more about this situation, even more about this dynamic duo, even more about what's up with this Mark situation. Stay tuned. Kind of like a soap opera, <laughs> but not a soap opera. So what have we learned so far today? I believe we've learned of the power of possibility. Don't ever put God in a box. Don't ever think that something isn't possible because with God, all things are possible. Even a mean, fire-breathing guy like Saul can actually be arrested by Jesus on the road to Damascus and end up being a super dynamic Christian. And the possibility that somebody like Barnabas could end up having a God-ordained assignment and they calling along with him. And so we've learned a little bit about a God-ordained assignments. We've learned a little bit about the Holy Ghost actually speaking. And sometimes when he speaks, he says, I want you to be teamed up with that person and I want you to go off and do this work. We've learned about redemption and second chances. If it weren't for redemption and second chances, we might not have most of the books of the New Testament. If it wasn't for the opportunity for Paul to come or Saul to come back into the fold, we never would have gotten to know this man who earned his way to leadership, who suffered his way and taught his way and clawed his way to be called Paul instead of Saul. 
if it wasn't for redemption and second chances. We wouldn't have had the man who planted all of the churches that we know of in the Bible that were meant to fully embrace Gentiles. Yes, you and me. And so it's beautiful that we get to learn about redemption and second chances. And I think we also learn about the power of partnership. What can be done when we work together, even former enemies? We could use this learning here in the United States of America. We can use this biblical learning, these examples, this story in the United States of America here in 2020 and moving into 2021. We can disagree without being disagreeable. And we can have opponents and not have them be enemies. Not when we have far more in common than we have that is different. We can not allow our differences to tear us down and to break us apart. And frankly, when we're different, we're better than the sum of our parts. We actually need to have diversity. We didn't want two Pauls. It was better to have a Paul and a Barnabas. It is better to have those differences. Because where you are weak, I am strong. Where I am weak, you are strong. We are better. We are more powerful. We can accomplish more together. We should embrace diversity, not as some tagline, not as some wink, wink, not as some secret code for ethnicity. We're talking about we are different because God made us different. He had a slightly different thought in his mind when he created each one of us. And we all matter and we all bring something to the table. And the stew or the gumbo, the meal is way better with all of our ingredients, with all of us coming to our individual forefronts of our individual purposes so that we can fully realize our collective purpose. Well, my friends, I hope this seed has been planted into your heart. I hope that as most of you are citizens of the United States of America, that you can see in this biblical lesson something that we could use, something that we can benefit from. The power of possibility. Keeping your mind open to what God can do. God ordained assignments and calling redemption, and second chances, and the awesome power of partnership. Well, I hope that you will join us again next week as we pick up from here, as we go to the other side of the to be continued, as we learn so much from this ongoing story. And to God be the glory. So, until we get to meet next time, maybe you'll watch this again. Maybe you'll learn even more. And I hope until we meet again that God richly bless you in a way that only he knows how.